Hello all, Tom Moran here from Tom's Big Spiders with three pit bull crosses trying to get on my lap right now. This should be an interesting one. Anyway, try to calm down a bit and relax a bit because Billy and I just rehoused my piece of Ethereum Metallica communal. It was in one of those cylinders. If you uh, go on YouTube, you can see the video for it. And they were getting obviously too big for the enclosure. Now, the weird thing about these this particular communal that I set up is that the growth rate, unlike my Embal Fori, where I didn't really have any runts or any giants, has been all over the place. We have two that look like they're going to be approaching four inches and then we have a few that are around three two and two and a quarter two and three quarters three inch mark and then a couple a little smaller and then there are two teeny tiny ones that look like they've barely grown at all and i've had people say well they're hogging food you know food hogs the ones aren't getting anything no it's not that there's plenty of food available at all times they're just not eating as much they don't seem to be spooked by the larger ones because i've seen them eating right next to each other again i've reported that i tried to get a video of this and couldn't the camera wouldn't focus which is really irritating but there was basically one of the tiny ones probably an inch and a quarter was eating a roach and one of the bigger ones grabbed another roach and was standing over top of it like on stilt legs eat for a moment eating the roach above it and neither of them seemed to care and it moved it brushed into the little one the little one just kind of calmly moved out of the way and they sat there eating next to each other so I've seen no signs of like quote-unquote bullying with them they're just growing at drastically different rates and I would say that compared to the first piece of Ethereum Metallica that I got which I got for my birthday oh god six years ago five years ago I can't remember that one grew very slowly some of the guys in this tank are growing ridiculously fast so we have ones now that went from easily about three quarters of an inch to an inch to pushing the four inch mark in about eight months or so nine months so that's really good growth they all are still getting along again I've alluded to the fact before that they, these are beautiful spiders I don't want to do something that results in one of them getting killed or injured because of the communal setup. So I'm watching them very, very carefully. I believe Tom Patterson has a setup with them and I do have to contact him. Hopefully he'll fill me in on how his is going. I think he brought his right up through adulthood and they were fine. I have read that in the wild, they will live together peacefully because of the fact that the, the dwindling territory that they have, they're forced to kind of hunker down in groups in the crooks of trees and under eaves of houses, things of that nature. So so far so good it's looking great but man that rehouse was not a lot of fun um some i've had people ask me and I, i'm sorry i can't remember i don't have my notebook in front of me right now billy just hopped up basically hopped out to go to the store after and probably calmed down a bit because she was holding the camera during this whole thing and I, so here i am doing my podcast so i just kind of sat right down to try to get it going so somebody asked about if i've ever used a couple videos if i've ever used the method where you basically chill the spider before you try to rehouse it which calms it down and Although I have not, I've talked to many people that have, and it's a good way to, if you're you know, worried about rehousing one that tends to be feisty or it's going to throw up a threat posture or could bolt, chilling it down in a refrigerator or like if I were to do it, I would probably use my garage. And I'm going to be completely honest. I thought about using this today with the piece of Ethereum Metallicas. However, I did want them to move. And the one problem is that I have heard they can become very sluggish and they won't you know, move when you try to prod them. So just something to be aware of. You don't want to stick them in your freezer or your refrigerator for too long just enough to slow them down because remember they don't register temperature supposedly the same way humans do or mammals do they just it, as the temperature gets colder they just slow down more and a lot of these guys will experience temperature drops in the wild and they slow way down that's sometimes where you see spiders that fast during certain times of the year that's because if they're in the wild they would probably be not hibernating but in kind of you know standby mode until the weather warmed up a little bit their metabolism sped up and they could find prey items so yes that is something you can use if you're you know you don't want to deal with a particularly fast or defensive tarantula I, i've heard of people using it to check ones out that were sick you put them in a, a refrigerator for a few minutes i've heard five to 15 minutes or so i haven't used it personally so i don't know what the magic number is but anybody out there that has done this if you want to give us you know in the comment section some insight as to you know where do you put them refrigerator freezer i'm assuming refrigerator and then how long do you keep them for in there for to get that slow down for the time you need to work with them so please feel free to chime in on that but i did not do it with these guys and basically what happened is a lot of times there's like four or five of them sitting right up at the top of the enclosure it's a cylinder with a cap and my goal was to pop the cap off and shoo them you know the ones that are sitting up top into 
the catch cup and move them over. Well, by the time I got done with my spiel and talking about what we were going to do, the majority of them retreated down underneath the cork bark, and then there was one of the little ones up top. So we got that one in first, and then it was just a game of cat and mouse where we tried to basically calmly shoo them off of the cork bark into my catch cup. It didn't work. They were sticking to the catch cup, I mean, to the cork bark like glue. It was amazing. They did not want to leave this piece of cork bark. So what I did was drag the cork bark out carefully, tried to shoe some more in again, didn't work. And again, I'm going to be posting this video hopefully up uh, this evening. So it'll be up there for people who want to actually see what's going on rather than hear me describe it. But they would not come off the cork bark. So what I did was the cheat method. I just picked up the whole piece of cork bark, moved it over into the new enclosure, set it in, and then just shooed them off of the cork bark into onto the new piece of cork bark. And what I did when I set up the enclosure, I put the new piece of cork bark in the corner of the enclosure and it's a glass, uh, not the, it's a Zoomed, uh, I forget what the actual name is, but it looks a lot like an Exoterra Nano, but there's no open front opening door. It's just top sliding top door. And I like using those usually for fossorial species, but because of the fact that some of these guys were so tiny, I didn't feel comfortable using an Exoterra Nano in this case because they do have those little vent holes and sometimes gaps around the doors where one of those little slings could easily escape or maybe get caught when I was doing maintenance. So... I had to opt for something without the doors, which the Zoomed makes a nice product that I use for that. But I basically angled the cork bark in one of the back corners and then took cardboard, put it over the back of behind it, so covered up two of the sides so that there was a nice dark area because these guys are very photosensitive. And I've noticed when I pick up the container, anytime I pick up the container to try to see what they're doing, they'll all be out hanging out on the cork bark. As soon as I pick up the container and bring it into the light, they all scuttle right behind and try to hide from the light. And if you turn the container in the light, they basically try to avoid the light and go behind wherever it's dark. So we tried to create a nice dark area so that when they did get into the enclosure, instead of bolting and running around it or possibly out of it, they would go right to the dark area. And it actually worked. They, the majority of them went behind there, hid behind the cork bark where it was darker. I still have it. They're all in now. We counted nine as we were doing it. There were originally 10. I've only seen nine at any given time, but we kind of, it was a stressful situation. Billy's trying to count them. I'm trying to count them. We kind of lost track. So what I'm going to do tonight is when I edit the video, I'm going to go through and try to get a good count. We did see both the tiny ones are still there. I've only seen one of the tiny ones at any given time. As we were doing the rehousing, we paused at one point because poor Billy's hand was shaking and she was stressed out trying to do both the camera work and actually help me with this and, and again I could not do these videos without her it's not just the videos it's the rehousings everybody's asking you know or a lot of people ask how, how do you get off so easy how are they so smooth because I have a second set of eyes at any given time I have a second set of hands at any given time we did a what was it an HMAC a while back and she was recording it and at one point things got sketchy where it was just I wasn't able to the HMAC didn't panic or anything. There was no like big emergency, but I needed a second set of hands. And I was like, Billy, go ahead, drop the camera. Let's do this. And she helped me out, got rather close to an HMAC. Unfortunately, apparently she didn't hear what I said before that it was uh, usually a very defensive and potent species because she got a little close to it, not in any danger. And I've talked about this story before. I kind of wish it was on video because it kind of would have been funny. I think I'm making it sound worse than it is. But for her, I think it was really exciting when she got done. She's like, oh, it's so gorgeous. Do you see it was only a, like a few inches away from me? I'm like, yeah, and that one could have put a hurting on you. So we've we make a, a point now of making sure she knows exactly what we're dealing with before we do it because I do not want her getting bit she's not only obviously doesn't just show a passing interest in them she does a lot with them now and is becoming like right hand woman as far as you know, the tarantula hobby here so it, when I do my rehousing videos I think what may differ from other people's rehousing videos and again this is not a knock I get it I totally get it I'm not doing these for YouTube. Uh, basically what's happening is I'm doing a rehouse. I know people are going to want to see it. I think there's always something to be gleaned and learned from a rehouse, especially when you're trying to do, you know, everybody's afraid to move one pokey. Now we're doing 10 of them. So I, I know there's an interest out there education wise for people who want to see this. And, and I think it does people watch these videos. And I love when I get the posts on like a pokey rehouse. Oh my gosh, I have a three inch pokey. I had to rehouse it. I've been panicking, but I watched your video and, and I moved it and everything went great. Thanks so much. That means the world to me. That's what makes this worthwhile. I don't need ad revenue. I don't need people sending me things. That means that I'm doing something and it's helping people out. That's why I do it. As corny as it may sound, that's my only motivation behind this. So when Billy and I sit down and go to plan out a rehouse, what's always stated right off the bat, I kind of run through what I think is going to happen because I have a, a game plan in mind. And then basically the rule of thumb is if anything goes wonky, drop the camera, we finish this. I don't care if it's the greatest rehouse in the world. If it's something that would have gotten a million hits on YouTube, I honestly don't care. 
What I want is the animals to be safely moved from point A to point B. I want my animals to remain safe. I want my wife to remain safe. I want my children who live here and my four little dogs. I love the four big dogs that I love to death to be safe. I have a, lately there's been somebody going on posting on my videos and it's kind of like a backhanded compliment I think but basically along the lines of my god you have the longest uh, rehouse videos ever you're so careful and so slow well yeah because it's not a race this isn't as far as I know we're not having competitions and if there were competitions out there between youtubers who can you know most quickly rehouse something I wouldn't even bother enter entering my goal is to keep the spiders from freaking out and I've had excellent luck I've also and I want to make this very clear because it's a matter of pride to me and I'm kind of getting sick of it I've had a couple people insinuate that I'm only posting up the good ones I have posted up every single rehousing video I've ever done I there's nothing held back there's been a couple where we've gotten one kind of scuttle into the you know plastic container I've had it in we've had a couple where the obviously the the C limitus uh, flood debacle that I tried to do the flood method which I know worked for some people I just I, I still stand by the fact that it can be unpredictable sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but that was a nightmare and I posted that up because I think people needed to see what happens when it goes wrong and I took a beating on that one but so be it I, I don't use it a lot and I know somebody on racking the boards was tearing me up like why would the idiot do this well because a lot of people told me it was a good method and I wanted to try it out and when it didn't work well instead of hiding it I showed so I do not cut stuff out I just firmly believe that if you're careful and you prep and you think of different possibilities of where these things can go then you can easily have very uh, what would be the term uh, not adventurous I don't even think that's an expression but you know calm rehousing so you don't need to have them turn into debacles it kind of and I'll, I'll say it does irritate me if a keeper is doing their YouTube video and they're talking to the camera they're mugging the camera they're looking great they're making jokes and then their spiders as a rehousing run away and fall on the floor I'm sorry that I, I have a hard time with that just as a what I, I like to consider a responsible keeper as somebody that tries to put my animals first I don't see the point in that that does irritate me so uh, my goal is I don't want and, and it's kind of like people that watch hockey for the fights or you're watching NASCAR and I have like friends that obviously are not true NASCAR fans or just I just wait for the crashes to go down or whatever. Uh, if that's why you're watching these videos, then don't watch mine. It's not going to happen. I hope it's not going to happen. If it does happen, I'm going to turn it into a learning experience. It's not going to be something I hope goes viral and people go, look at this idiot that can't do a transfer of tarantulas without hurting the tarantulas and putting his family in danger. That's not what I'm about. So anyway, that's my, when I do these rehousings and I've got Billy there, always know that, it, and again, the only one I can think of that we ever aborted in the middle of it was the one with the HMAC and it was just I was having a hard time negotiating the catch cup at one point and the HMAC was up top and I had it in a good spot and I wanted to get it in I'm like I need an extra set of hands here there was nothing it wouldn't have been a great adventurous video anyway and we ended up doing one later on that we got the HMAC on film anyway but it, it was one where it just it made more sense to have Billy not worrying about doing a camera and more worried about trying to get the spider out and into the enclosure without anybody getting hurt. So that's how I approach things. I will be doing an intro to this video where I try to explain this again. And obviously, I understand, and, and I've been cognizant of this for a long, long time. For I think the people who really like my channel are the ones that are really into the hobby, that are reading, they, they want information, they want to see how the rehousings go, they want to see how I keep things, they want to, you know, now we got the bioactive stuff, I think a lot of people are curious about how that turns out, it's informative, I'm not doing this to attract a bunch of people that know nothing about spiders. I would rather not deal with that. I mean, I'll be the cranky old man here. I don't need people coming, oh, my brother had a tarantula. We used to throw it at each other and play with it. And like, and these are the kind of comments you get. Or I hate spiders so much, I squish them. I don't get a lot of those because I think the majority of the people that are on my page, the quote unquote boringness of my videos or the lack of action. And maybe I, I flat out, I don't have the best camera work. I don't have the, Billy, I think does an amazing job, but you know, I'm using a Samsung. We bought another camera for it and I don't like it as much. So I'm just stuck to using my phone. I do some editing, but I don't go crazy with it. I get it. And I like the fact that my stuff isn't super slick so that I'm not attracting people that are just basically going to bog down the channel with, you know, very elementary questions about spiders not the hobbyists you know I'm talking just people out there that are just like oh look at giant spiders this is cool there are some amazing channels out there that are entertaining and informative that 
can attract those people in. I, I'm okay with that. I look at some of the comment sections of these guys. And again, I've said it a million times. I don't think I could do this if I can't. I, I need to respond to all the comments on my videos. Um, that's what takes up a lot of my time now. And next is my website. And I got to respond to those comments. And then unfortunately, Facebook's been lagging behind because I just don't get on Facebook a lot. But as far as the videos, I need to be able to respond to people on there. I get a lot of questions. That's where a lot of the learning happens now. And I wouldn't be able to do that if I was getting bombarded by, you know, thousands of messages. It would drive me nuts. I already told Billy, like, I can't imagine getting that many messages. And then you, you're left with two, you know, two choices. You try to answer them all, and which would become a full-time job, or you don't answer them. And then people, you know, are, I think, get upset because they want to interact with you. They want so. Anyway, totally fine with being who I am doing what I'm doing now and love because I've been getting a lot of comments lately with people who actually get what I'm doing that they like don't I, I love the ones that are like don't change good because I really don't plan on and I know it frustrates some people because they watched my videos and uh, they you know I had somebody like hey I could do so much better if you just send me I'll, I'll produce all your videos for you and we'll make them slick and we'll do a new intro and it's like no that's not me that's I'm doing this because I enjoy putting them together it's my it's an extension of teaching for me and for me to give up that kind of control for what? To make them slicker, to have more editing, to have cut things out that I think are important for people to see. It's just not worth it for me. I'd rather, I'll, I'll plug along with what I'm getting now for new subscribers. I'm able to keep up with it. I'm able to respond to everybody and it's fun and fulfilling for me. So anyway, I'll be posting that video up. That should be up by the time this podcast goes live. I usually put these up on Sunday night. I'm planning to have this video done probably tonight is my goal. There's a UFC event that's on, and so I kind of usually do some of the editing and stuff while that's on. So hopefully we'll get that one up, and people who want to, I'll put a link in this description. They can go over and actually watch the video. It's, it's going to be a little long and boring because it took us a little while, but we took our time and tried to go about it the best way possible to keep everybody, spiders, people, children, dogs, safe. So moving on, the other day I was on, a couple weeks ago I was on Facebook, and obviously I'm doing these bioactive enclosures. And I had a lot of people coming on. You should be using isopods. You should be using springtails. You should be using isopods. Use isopods. You should use these isopods. You can use, and they started showing me there's all these different, you know, there's blue isopods, there's purple isopods. There's what were ones called rubber ducky isopods. They actually looked amazing. Like I just keep those for pets. All these different things. And, and so obviously being new to this, I years ago got a bunch of dwarf white isopods from an order. I placed an order from a place, uh, uh, some guys that aren't around anymore, but they used to send dwarf white isopods to anybody that ordered. And I kept a bunch and I'd been raising them for quite some time and I put them in some enclosures. So basically here's the story. Um, I was online and they were talking about how all isopods, particularly the larger ones, but all isopods have the ability to attack a molting tarantula and injure or kill it or attack a reptile. There was somebody talking about that. I think it was a gecko. And again, I tried to find this post this morning so I could reference the person, the people that were involved in the discussion and the actual animals. And I couldn't find something. I'm terrible at finding anything on Facebook. I'm just not savvy at it. So basically, the, the long story short, somebody went on and posted, for those of you using isopods for tarantulas, no, they can harm your spiders. And then people came on and went, no, they can't. And somebody went on and went, no, you know how the Facebook arguments go. Well, then somebody came on that basically fashioned themselves as, this, and I, I'm not using this term ironically, they, they sound like they know a lot about isopods. They knew all the scientific names. Obviously, I'm calling them dwarf whites. I should have looked up the scientific name before, but I want people to realize what I'm talking about here. And I don't think a lot of us casuals are as familiar with the scientific names as we should be. So he specifically named dwarf whites as ones that are probably safer but if the numbers explode they can attack they've found that some of the isopods actually crave protein and they will get it from attacking weak animals or animals in a molting state so i read this with great interest because my first reaction again one of the things i always talk about across the board is having an open mind and my first reaction if i'm being completely honest was yeah 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 of course they can sure they can i'm sure that happens a lot and then the more I read, the more it made sense to me. And the more I started thinking, ooh, this is something to keep an eye on. I use these. I use dwarf white isopods in my enclosures. I have for a while. I've never had an issue with them. So it was one of those deals where what started off as uh, kind of skeptical turned into more, this is something I need to keep an eye on. And unfortunately, like a ding dong, I 
basically tried to, you know, bookmark that page so I could go back to it and I can't even find it. Apparently I screwed up. So I don't know how it turned out, but the guy basically that came forward seemed to really know what he was talking about and said, listen, it may not be common. It can happen. There was talk about a gecko that was basically eaten alive by some of the bigger ones, which was pretty gnarly. And the guy said there was nothing wrong with it. It wasn't sick. It sat in the ground, got some on him, and they were basically chewing holes in him which is scary because obviously a lot of people that are doing bioactive enclosures use isopods and springtails. And the idea when I got into it and a lot of the research I did, everybody said the dwarf whites were harmless. They're not going to hurt anything. Just keep the numbers from exploding. And I haven't had an issue with any numbers exploding. So again, something, when you hear something like this, you file it away and you wait to see if you ever come into any evidence that leads you to believe it may be true. I always, like anything I hear, no matter how wonky, and I didn't necessarily think this sounded wonky, I thought the guy put forth a, a very credible argument. I wanted to see, you know, now that I'm doing the bioactive enclosures, this is something I needed to keep an eye on, long story short. So fast forward a little bit. Well, actually, before this, I should say, a week before that, I went to check on my uh, Titius Stigmurus uh, communal. I have a bunch of, if you remember, I bought one, T. stigmaris was a female. They reproduce parthenogenically. So as my female matured within about eight months or so, I had 21 T. stigmaris, uh, lots of little babies, and they were all doing great. And I've had people say they had a hard time keeping these. I've had no problem. My female is still alive. The, the adult female still doing great. She's had three broods. I gave some away. I sold some. And then basically I kept the first group of babies she had. So originally there were... 20, I want to say 21, two of them fell off her back. I tried to keep them alive. They died. So we were down to 19. And then during the course of the other ones maturing, we lost one more. And then at that point we had 18. Oh, my math is totally screwy there. 21. Yeah, we'll go at 18. There was 18 total that lived. So I kept them in a communal setup. Then once they got a certain size, I moved them into like a two gallon container, clear container, set up a communal setup put in some cocoa fiber for substrate, put in some pieces of cork bark for them to hide, some moss, and I dropped in some dwarf white ice pods, which I've been keeping with them from day one because what happens is when you've got a communal of these guys, there's going to be a lot of, you know, parts, the the, ex, the exoskeletons when they molt, the pieces of prams get dropped down, that's going to create quite a mess quickly because what I will usually do with these guys with 18 of them, I would drop in quite a few small red runners to feed them and then over the course of a couple weeks, they would eat all the red runners and I'd do it again. And that obviously creates a lot of waste. So I would keep the isopods in there. They did an amazing job of cleaning up. Like you didn't find many, they were, I believe they were eating the old exoskeletons. They were eating any of the prey remnants. I wasn't getting any mold, any fungi, anything like that. It was a clean enclosure. They were doing a great job and everybody was living fine. So these guys, the 18 mature, haven't lost a single one yet. Two of them have babies of their own. Most of those babies survived and they're growing great. Then another one has babies. And then I go to check the other day and I open the container, go to spray down the thing. And I notice one of them doesn't look well. So I reach in there, it's dead. And I'm like, oh, this is really disappointing. Um, they weren't old. It wasn't old age. They, the female, their, their mom is still alive. And I was like curious as to what could have happened to her. But it was like, it was one, who knows, uh, things can happen, bad molt, whatever. So I, I plucked it out, fed them, no problem. Come in next week to feed them again. Three dead. Now I've got a problem. So now panic mode starts. Like, what is going on? It's And it's not the little ones. The little ones are all doing fine. It was the big ones. They're all three, four big ones now dead. So now we're down to 14 of the original 18, which that's when I knew something was up. Like, I couldn't figure out what it was. So I pulled, I, I ended up finding a couple of them. I, I pulled these ones out. And one of the things I noticed is when I went to count the big ones, there seemed to be down a few, which I couldn't figure out. And now they do, if you if you keep T. sigmuris, they like to go out. I put cork bark at 45 degree angles and some of them will hide. They'll like perch on the cork bark, but some of them will go down to the bottom of the cork bark and you'll get like a group of them at the bottom. So when I shined the flashlight in and looked underneath the cork bark, it looked like there were several of the adults under there and I couldn't get a count on them. So I wasn't alarmed yet, but it did, you know, we're losing a couple. We've lost four already. And now I, I couldn't get a count on the adults, but the little ones are all, the little ones always hang up high. So they all look fine. So the other day I come in, go to feed them four more dead ones. Now I'm in panic mode. Like I'm truly, I call Billy. I'm like, I don't know what is going on. This is weird. Again, four of the adults. So I'm like, what? I, I don't understand what's happening. They're all huddled together and like on the ground. One of them's, there was two of them huddled together underneath the bottom of one of the pieces of cork bark. And there was one over kind of under another piece of cork bark and there was one right out in the open. 
So I go to reach in with my tongs and I pick up what I think is one of them and there's only half of a scorpion there. The other half is gone. I'm like, oh my God, one of them actually ate the scorpion. Then I realize underneath the other part of it is a mass of dwarf white, adult dwarf white isopods underneath it. And I flip over the remaining part of the carcass, dwarf white isopods all over it. Then I pull up the other ones, dwarf white isopods all underneath them. Now, here's where, and this is going to be speculation on my part. And I will be able to talk about more of this in a future one because I just did a massive, I did a whole rehousing of them, changed the substrate. But here is what I started to realize. All of the, the smaller ones were fine. I still had the same number of the babies. So you'd think if something was wrong with the conditions, the babies would be the most susceptible to it and they would be the ones dropping off and dying. They were fine. All of them I counted, they were all still there. All the babies were fine, doing well, hiding in the crooks of the cork bark up off the ground. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the adults had started, a lot of them will kind of congregate on the ground. They'll walk around patrolling the ground. They won't always go up. And a lot of them had dug little burrows underneath the bottom of the cork bark, and they lived there. So the ones, the adults were always on ground and obviously in contact with the dwarf white isopods. So what I'm suspecting is happening is that the adults are going on the ground and getting swarmed by the dwarf whites because every now this is one of those which comes first the chicken of the egg or the egg thing because obviously dwarf white isopods are there to clean up any debris and if one of these guys dies and lays on the ground they would obviously come and eat it but I am suspecting that they might have been the cause of the deaths to begin with because it just seems odd. And I honestly had no idea I had that many dwarf whites in there. So again, a warning to people who are using them. The numbers can explode. I took, basically after I rehoused them, I dumped all the dirt into my container with my colony of dwarf whites that I keep. And I was shocked at how many. they it, Normally when I keep them, they stay mostly to the top. This container was swarming with them so i'm thinking and i want people to chime in this is um this is how i figure through things this is the, the thought process so i'm sharing it as as opposed to coming to you guys like this is exactly what happened i'm just kind of sharing this like it's a little mis uh, murder mystery several of the adults it's only the adults they were all on the ground when i did a recount on the adults three more were missing completely i got a funny feeling they were completely devoured they're gone they're not in there there's no remnants of them if you shine a black light in there you see very little small particles of like the molts and pieces of scorpion so i think that some of them were being devoured and i just never saw it because they were underneath because you go in there's several pieces of cork bark it's hard i don't like to move them all around and startle them i'll shine a flashlight in i'll see some of them sitting there i assume they're okay but apparently they were getting devoured by the dwarf whites it's the only thing I could think of. And when I pulled the cork bark pieces out, I could see that the dwarf whites had basically covered the bottom of the cork bark, all the pieces of cork bark, about half an inch up or so they were there, and then they wouldn't go any further than that. So the ones, it would make sense that the babies, the ones that weren't getting eaten or devoured, the ones that were hanging up high on these pieces of cork bark were totally fine. That would be why the adults were eaten, because the adults were all hanging on the ground, which would make them targets for the isopods. So again, I always like to try to make it clear when something's my opinion or something speculation, this is speculation on my part, but it fits and it fits well. And I'm glad I saw that Facebook post because I'd be going nuts right now trying to figure out again, could it be that something was killing off the adults and then the isopods were just taking advantage of the fact that there was fresh meat in there? Yes, of course that's, but it just doesn't fit that something would kill off just the healthy adults. And these guys have been doing great. They eat great. I never let the cage dry out. There's good ventilate. There's nothing I can point to that would cause these guys to suddenly die. They've been in this enclosure for a year with no issues. So what has suddenly changed? Well, the explosion in dwarf whites, and there were a lot of big, beefy, fat adults underneath those dead scorpions. And the fact that I'm missing some leads me to believe that basically they were getting devoured and I had no idea, which makes me feel absolutely terrible. I apparently I should have done some more research on this, but I asked so many people before I started this. I got these guys like three years ago, the dwarf whites and everybody's, Oh no, they're totally, if you use the little guys, they're totally harmless. Some of the bigger ones could pose an issue, but if you use the little guys, I wouldn't use them with slings, which I don't, I never use them with slings, but they're totally okay. And apparently they're not. So I'm going, what I did was this stunk because I had a ridiculously busy week at work and I came home and I was exhausted and I just wanted to basically, you know, relax, uh, play a little video games, 
uh, calm down and I go to check on these guys to feed them and find the other dead ones and it just goes into freak out mode. So I'm doing a rehousing of a bunch of rather potent uh, scorpions at 7.30 at night when I'm usually just getting ready for bed and getting ready to go up and watch some TV or something and fall asleep. And it was not fun. So what I did was I pulled all the cork bark out and with the scorpions on it, put it in a container and then went through, cleaned out all of the old substrate, dumped it in with my other dwarf white isopods. I want to hold on to that, although now I'm afraid that they're like they've all turned into like scorpion and tarantula eating monsters but i did keep that because i didn't want to throw away a bunch of dwarf whites although i don't think i'm going to be using them anymore added some of the bio dude bioactive uh terra arania which is made for both spiders and scorpions added some of that in there moistened it up added some of the you know uh, leaf litter added some sphagnum moss put some new cork bark in there and then got all the babies the little guys back and there's only i think three of the adults left which is heartbreaking for me because i love these guys I, my whole goal was to do a bioactive enclosure for these i mentioned before that i was going to do ones with scorpions these were the guys i was eyeing i was going to do the t stigmuris and obviously the emperors were ones i was eyeing for a bioactive one so this is not a bioactive enclosure right now i need to buy a new enclosure for them i'm going to get one of those zoom med ones i was talking about earlier and set them up in it with some plants but it's good enough for now got rid of dusted off all the isopods that were on the cork bark got the got those off of there and then put them back in put some springtails in this time because i do have springtails in now and now i'm going to monitor and see how they're doing and i checked yesterday everybody seemed fine it's been about a week or something not even a week no about three days four days i think this might have been monday or tuesday losing track of time here but everybody seems like they're doing okay right now and i will obviously keep people updated but the point of this whole thing is a if you're using isopods with your arachnids be careful Keep an eye on them. BioDude, when I looked at his video, one of the things he said in his video is you can use the bugs, but be careful the populations don't explode. That could, They could overwhelm the, the tarantulas or the animals. And it looks like he was absolutely right. This wasn't a case of just a few of them. This was a case of a lot of them that were probably not getting enough food in there because unfortunately when you drop, and this is something you need to consider, when you drop isopods or springtails into just regular dirt or cocoa fiber, there's not a lot of nutrients. There's not a lot, a lot for them to eat there. So the scorpions, you feed them the roaches, they drop some of the parts, they drop some of their exoskeletons, they can eat those, but then they run out of food. So then what's going to happen? They can either, like I've seen them kind of go into shutdown mode, or they can attack something that's sitting on the ground and start eating it because they're starving. And I think that's probably what happens. So a huge oversight on my part. I'm, believe me, I'm upset about this. And I was telling Billy, like, I just didn't know. It didn't occur to me. When, the, when I found the, the, the first batch of dead adults, I was panicking. But I went in there. I you know made sure there was no, I cleaned everything up. I, I couldn't figure out what could be killing them. It was only afterwards. And I don't know if, it's weird because when I pulled those out, I didn't notice the isopods. But again, it was later at night. I don't know. I feel like I should have caught it then, but it was reading that Facebook post and the individual and if hopefully somebody knows who it is and can point me in the right direction because I'd like to give him a huge thank you. But hearing that guy say, no, they can attack even the little ones because people are like, no, not dwarf whites. I've used them for years. He's like even the little ones can develop a hunger for eating. You know, they, they got to get their protein, their food somewhere. They can hurt. Uh, animals that you put them in with. And I think at one point he even backed out of the conversation because nobody was listening to him. Well, buddy, I heard you. I thank you. I do hope somebody knows this one and can give me a link to it so that I can contact the person and personally thank him. And next time I will mention his name in this because I didn't come up with this on my own. And luckily, because of this individual came out and said what was an unpopular opinion, people were jumping all over. I think one guy came on and kind of said it in a way that it was more less informative and more kind of inciting something. And then the other guy came on and went, no, let me explain and did it very professionally. Like he was trying to teach people this can happen. And the information got out there. So I think some people kind of immediately bristled and just took a defensive stance, which was part of it. But obviously good information. This probably saved a lot more of my, well, not only my scorpions, but I'm not going to be using these guys with the tarantulas now. I don't think maybe with the adults, we'll see maybe with the boreals. But I mean, here's one of the deals. If I set up a bioactive enclosure, there's a lot of leaf litter on the ground. There's a lot of, you know, the sphagnum moss, the, the there's stuff for them to eat they could easily, the numbers could easily explode. And then what happens if I have a tarantula, molt upside down, all wet 
on the ground, it could easily be overwhelmed by these. And I don't know how to, how do you go in and really check whether or not the populations are exploding? I'm assuming you go in there and kind of scrape away some of the surface debris and see what's going on underneath it, but that's going to be a tough thing to monitor. So now I'm kind of gun shy about using them. So for the time being, they are in a couple enclosures. I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye on it to make sure that they're not exploding and harming my animals. But I do think it's something people need to be aware of because I've had so many people come on these bioactive enclosure videos I've been putting up and going, you need isopods, you need isopods, you need isopods. Well, um, I don't know if I need isopods anymore. I don't want them killing my animals. I'm still heartbroken over the loss of my T. stigmuris. That was like finding those babies on that mother the first time was one of the coolest things ever. To actually see a female reproduce asexually is just mind boggling to me. And I took a lot of pride in the fact that raising those guys up, the ones that I'd lost, I could tell were the weak ones. They weren't in good shape. It was nothing I was doing. Had all those healthy young adults and adults. They were starting to have babies and now this. So that one stings a lot. So heads up to anybody using the feeder insects. It's obviously, I haven't heard anything about the springtail. I have heard people say springtails can be a bit of a nuisance if they explode, but I don't think they actually feast on the spiders or the scorpions. Obviously, isopods, different story. And I've had people like, I, one of the things I was looking up is all the different types of isopods you can get. There's like designer series, which are cool, but I don't think I want to stick any of those in with my tarantulas or scorpions, quite frankly, because I don't want to end up with dead tarantulas or scorpions. And some of them are so pretty, I don't want to end up with dead isopods because some of them are quite large and easily could make food for a tarantula. So sharing this more as a heads up to people, again, I do hope people that knew, know more than me about isopods and this type of stuff will chime in with their stories because I do I would like to do a follow-up and it would be nice to actually have some personal accounts of things that people have gone through with these or maybe some information about you know maybe you've had a situation where they've devoured a tarantula or a scorpion or a sling or whatever let's get that info out there so people are aware because I think a lot of people are not and hopefully because I feel bad this guy came out and obviously knew what he was talking about and people were just kind of trashing him or not listening to him Hopefully this will add some credence to what he's saying and maybe we can get him on here to talk about it. That would be great personally because I, again, I'm speculating right now. I'm not an expert on isopods. I am in no way, shape or form an expert on bioactive enclosures. I'm not an expert on tarantulas. I'm not an expert on anything. Maybe just teaching. I'm a pretty good teacher. So uh, hopefully we'll get somebody on here that knows and we can get some you know, really good information on that and, and put people's minds at ease if they want to use these animals to clean up their cages. Okay, so I think that'll about do it for this one. I think that... Uh, I, I do these podcasts and sometimes like I, I have these really great ideas and I get done with them like Ugh. like last week's I thought was going to be terrible. I, it just seemed boring like oh, Tom talking about shipping, but I got a lot of great feedback on it. So that's awesome. So we'll see. This one I'm pretty I'm feeling pretty good about because, you know, hey, you know, pokey communal, how can you beat that? And then the isopods, I'm hoping this will be something that gets around. And again, I, I want people to chime in. This isn't I, I please don't when you post my stuff. Tom Moran says this, so it's right. No, never, never take my word for it. There are many people out there that have much more experience than I do. They've been doing this a lot more than I have that know more than I do. So put it out there like this is something Tom Moran has observed. Um, this is something Tom Moran thinks works, but it's, remember, I, there are very few absolutes in this hobby. I don't profess to be an expert. I'm always learning. So the way you approach people sometimes too can be a huge turnoff. Nobody wants to hear about this know-it-all that has a YouTube channel and does podcasts because immediately somebody hears that and they think, oh, this guy's full of himself. Do it in a way so that people will respond positively. We get some good information. I'd love to revisit this topic. And then obviously, if you'd like, I'm going to put the video for the Peace Lotharia Metallica rehousing in the description of this. So I'll put the link in there in articulate this morning. I haven't finished my whole coffee because we jumped right into this rehousing. I still have a half a cup of Dunkin' Donuts sitting over there, with my name on it. So anyway, I'm going to put that in there for the people that actually want to see it. And it's probably going to be a little bo long and boring, but you'll see what a long, boring rehousing looks like. There you go. So as always, thanks so much for listening. I am going to try to catch up on Facebook this week, but please know, and I'm just going to put this out there as a warning, my time is incredibly limited this time of the year. I am a special education teacher. There, I said it because I think people are giving me a hard time. Like, oh, what do you mean busy season? And some people have figured it out, and thank you for going ahead and defending me. But I have to do a lot of IEPs, reports. I'm attending meetings all over the place. And it's just, I'm exhausted when I get home. And the last thing I want to do is hop on Facebook. And plus, there's been a lot of negative stuff on there lately, and I can't stand reading that. So I, I will try to catch up on Facebook. But if you really want to get a hold of me in a hurry, my best, my, and this is going to sound silly, but 
go over, pick a random video on YouTube and, and comment, say, hey, Tom, I need your advice and I'll get to it a lot fast. Those are the things I'm able to keep up with very, very quickly. That's my first stop when doing comments. It's just, it's easier for me now. I can get more people at one time. So thanks for listening. Please feel free to post a comment. I'm going to head over to Facebook in a little bit and try to answer some questions and whatnot. And we'll catch you guys all next time.